thank you, Christine, and thanks to the organizers. I think we're going to have some really great conversations here uh, in the next two days. Uh, I want to start with a couple of uh, simple but uh, important and fundamental questions. Do human activities improve nature or diminish it? What is the relative weight of natural and social forces in shaping the patterns of flora and fauna that we observe? These debates, uh, the debates on these questions in Western science and philosophy are centuries old, unresolved and hotly contested. And we know, of course, the early Greeks had an idea of, of a harmonious nature in balance of which uh, humankind was a part. Uh, 18th century European philosophers believed that humans did uh, and could improve upon a nature, perfect nature. But at least uh, since uh, 1864, when George Perkins, George Perkins Marsh published Man and Nature, uh, we've had the idea, uh, as Marsh so succinctly put it, as uh, man the disturber of nature's harmonies. And this sort of attitude of humans degrading the environment has been uh, the fundamental assumption behind uh, the drive for wilderness parks as the main uh, means of protecting biodiversity. Now, the structure of these uh, debates appears to vary not only historically, but geographically. I'm going to pull this down. In the global south, many natural scientists, conservationists, see desertification, deforestation, degradation, uh, driven by overpopulation and local mismanagement. Now, according to this degradation narrative, biodiversity is under threat from decades of human misuse of the environment. In Europe, however, the environmental narrative is quite different, even inverted. According to uh, various EU agencies and many scientists, Europe's Biodiversity is the product of centuries of human uh, activities. It is the product, essentially, of a combination of culture and nature. Now, these uh, contrasting environmental narratives raise a third question. Does the nature society dialectic manifest in distinctly different ways from one continent to the next? So in this paper, I'm going to use these three questions as reminders about the fundamental assumptions that underpin many of the policy and science debates around biodiversity and forests. I also want to use them to highlight how the conceptualization of nature-society relations is contingent, contextual, and highly politicized. Now, I'm going to be discussing recent biodiversity and forest management initiatives in the EU, but I first want to place it in the context of um, uh, the global south, particularly Africa. What I'm going to be talking about in the EU is, is uh, what I label the EU's biodiversity narrative. Now, the bulk of the presentation will be concerned with this, but I want to begin by uh, juxtaposing Europe with my previous work in Africa. Now, I refer to my earlier research in Tanzania as a means to think about the way nature society relations and forests are conceptualized in different times and places. The findings of my study at Arusha National Park uh, pointed to the history and the politics of park creation uh, as the roots of a conflict over uh, biodiversity. First, the park establishment curtailed uh, the Meru, the Meru people, the local residents in the area, uh, curtailed their existing rights of access to water, grazing pasture, fuel wood, and other resources inside the forest. And this park uh, originally was a forest reserve. And the first thing that foresters did was stop traditional Meru grazing and burning of pastures in the forest. And eventually, all uh, non-timber forest product collection was outlawed, and uh, it became a wilderness park. The second thing is the government expanded the park boundaries several times by alienating or appropriating uh, Meru ancestral lands. And what you're looking at in this cross-hatched area is the extent of Meru uh, territorial claims at the end of the 19th century. You can see most of their land was either alienated for European farms, uh, the forest reserve, and eventually the national park. Now, colonial and post-colonial administrators argued that uh, this was necessary because the Meru were mismanaging the forest and were ignorant of its conservation value. Now, I documented a similar, similar 
uh, though not identical history of colonial and post-colonial displacement in southeastern Tanzania. Uh, the Salu Game Reserve is popularly uh, known as the last remaining primordial wilderness in Africa. Excuse, excuse me, the largest remaining primordial wilderness in Africa. Um, it's uh, the second largest protected area in the world, in fact. Um, but, of course, it became a wilderness only very recently. It is indeed peopleless and roadless, but the transformation into wilderness took place uh, only a few decades ago. Uh, for many centuries, uh, various African peoples lived in uh, this area. It was a major, hooked up to major trade routes uh, into the Indian Ocean. And uh, in the 1930s, the Colonial Game Department was having trouble managing uh, people wildlife conflicts, and so they decided to essentially corral all the elephants, drive them into the Salu, or what became the Salu, and then move all the people uh, out of the Salu. And this was a, uh, an enormous uh, endeavor, and geographically speaking. Um, it covered an area of several, the size of several European countries, and eventually uh, 40,000 people were moved out of the Salu uh, in this scheme. Now the histories of Arusha National Park and the Salu Game Reserve uh, represent typical stories of fortress conservation in Africa. Typically these evictions are based on neo-Malthusian concerns of overpopulation and claims of irrational and unsustainable resource use. And these ideas continue in conservation initiatives today. And I'll take just one example, uh, the idea of global hotspots. Now, Conservation International, some of you may be aware, has embraced this uh, model of biodiversity and essentially um, shaped major uh, policy initiatives around it. And what are you looking at here is one of 34 hotspots that uh, CI has identified. Uh, this is the, in uh, the forest in, in the uh, Ghanaia region. And the idea here, as you can see in the text, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it's basically the same, you know, slash and burn everywhere, overpopulation, population exploding, and uh, pristine forest is disappearing. Now, the other hot spot I want to put up is the Mediterranean. And here you see a slightly different narrative. Uh, here you see human activities as shaping this uh, region for many centuries, and you also see this uh, so-called paradox, that is, that grazing and fire can actually maintain species richness, while in the absence of these activities, uh, biodiversity declines. Now the exceptionalism of Europe, implying that humans have shaped and even improved Europe's bi biodiversity, is a theme that recurs often in the EU's biodiversity narrative. For Conservation International, the fact that a disturbed forest is more biodiverse than an undisturbed forest is a paradox. So what I'm going to do today then is look at Europe's purported exceptionalism and this seeming paradox uh, in the remainder of this paper. So let's turn to the European Union. The European Union has pledged to halt biodiversity loss by 2010. They're not going to make it, but they, they're trying. Uh, how? Well, they've launched the most ambitious biodiversity conservation program in the region's history. The EU strategy is founded on the Natura 2000 project, you're looking at the map of it here, of uh, a new sort of pan-European system of protected areas. Now the EU's uh, 1979 Birds Directive and the 1992 Habitats Directive are the main pieces of legislation uh, that require together member states to identify uh, sites of uh, biodiversity importance and include them in the network. You can see in the map that the Mediterranean is overrepresented. Uh, Spain, in particular, has about 22% of its land in Natura 2000 sites. Now, the selection and designation of Natura 2000 sites is based on a hierarchical classification system of European habitats called the Corine biotypes. And Corine just stands for Coordination of Information on the Environment. They, they have an acronym, an acronym for everything in the EU, I'm finding. Now, in analyzing the Corine Biotopes Interpretation Manual, yes, there's an interpretation manual, and other EU documents, uh, an EU biodiversity narrative emerges. 
first, many of the chlorine habitat types, including forest habitats, are defined as being produced by long-term human husbandry. Furthermore, many of the forest habitat types, uh, the nature, soundry, nature society boundary is blurred and indeterminate, as you see from this quote up here. Not sure where nature begins and culture ends and vice versa. Now, because many highly biodiverse habitats were shaped by human use, and because the boundary between nature and culture is indeterminate, the EU has emphasized the importance of traditional land management practices for biodiversity conservation. According to the EU's environmental agency, Europe's biodiversity peaks under human use. And you can see under something called traditional cultural disturbance, uh, somewhere around 1,000 years ago, the biodiversity of Europe uh, peaked. Now, as the bi EU biodiversity narrative has it, quote, in Europe, more than on any other continent, the influence of human activity has shaped biodiversity over time. However, traditional extensive land use practices are threatened. The forces of globalization, neoliberal reform, etc. cetera. Uh, the EU uh, has linked biodiversity losses to changes in agriculture and rural occupancy, particularly abandonment of traditional farming areas. Now, according to the EEA, a loss of biodiversity is almost always associated with uh, land abandonment. So, consequently, the EU has uh, a number, uh, and as part of their conservation uh, strategy, is a number of financial instruments that essentially direct payments to uh, land managers and, and with the idea of keeping people on the land. So where do forests fit into this biodiversity scheme? Well, over half of the Natura 2000 sites are classified as forest. The EU gives priority to integrating biodiversity conservation into forest management. In the coordination of uh, EU forest policy, there was no forest uh, statement in the original treaty. So coordination of the forest uh, policy falls to something called the Ministerial Conference on the Protection of Forests in Europe or the NCPFE. Now, rescaling forest policy and management from the national to the supranational also uh, necessitates rescaling science. That is, you have 27 separate forestry agencies uh, that have to be consolidated into uh, a single voice. So the categorization of essentially the, answering the question, what is a forest, has to be rescaled for uh, the EU 27. And so the use of, uh, of classification systems is important. Unfortunately, the EU has uh, several. Um, and I want to just take one example to show you how this might work. So there, there are four classification systems going right now. There's the Corine land cover, Corine biotopes, the current MCPFE, and then the proposed uh, forest typology that's uh, already being used but not, hasn't been approved. Um, and you can see, I'm gonna, you we're talking about one forest type here, this agro-silvopastoral system called the ESAS in Spain. Uh, and you can see on different classification systems, sometimes it's not included at all. Uh, sometimes it's called a grassland, sometimes it's called a forest, sometimes it's called agroforestry. And what's interesting is this is the same picture is used, you know, this is the interpretation manual, so imagine the EU has to tell everybody how to identify a forest. The same picture is used in the biotope uh, interpretation manual to indicate grassland, and it's the same photo in the new typology to indicate broadleaf evergreen forest. So, it gets more interesting. MCPFE also classifies forests in terms of naturalness, or degree of naturalness. So the EU has three grades of naturalness, naturalness and I'm not gonna uh, read through this, you can look at it uh, very quickly. Um, basically, you have forests undisturbed by man. Yes, they still use man in Europe. Uh, semi-natural forests and plantations, which I don't have up here. 
But you get the idea that, and I've, and I've condensed these uh, uh, quite a bit. They're long descriptions, very convoluted, sometimes contradictory, sometimes pretty odd, like semi-natural forest. You can have native trees that are artificially regenerated, and you can have non-native trees that are naturally regenerated, but I don't think you can have non-native trees that are artificially regenerated. Then it becomes a plantation. <laughs> so, the great majority of EU forests are classified as semi-natural. That is 88%. And you can see the silly uh, time scale. That, that there's very little change uh, over the years. Um, but the change that is happening is in these forests, in the forest policy, the shift is going from timber production to biodiversity conservation. And this has uh, caused some anxiety among European forestry agencies in the member states. And it's compelled the EC to publish a primer on forests in Natura 2000, specifically to dispel fears of the idea of uh, fortress style forest reserves. So you have in this quote, uh, natural heritage uh, has been shaped over the centuries by humans. Uh, humans are a part, they actually enhance biodiversity, and uh, in the case of forestry, we need to keep human activities in place and going. In short, no one's going to get kicked out of the forest because of Natura 2000. So what does the shift in biodiversity conservation mean in terms of silvicultural practices? Again, it's very convoluted, contradictory. But I'll just point out that in some forest biotopes, threatened species that have to be protected under Natura 2000 actually require uh, what are considered traditional extensive management practices, such as transhuman grazing, coppicing, pollarding, and the like. So in summary then, forest ecologists found that the land use practices have increased plant diversity in certain forest ecosystems. And forest naturalness and biodiversity are often inversely related. That is, uh, having a natural forest does not necessarily mean a biodiverse forest. So the forest policies then are aimed at restoring traditional management practices like this silvopastoral system in Spain. Now, forest owners can, see, uh, can receive direct payments from the EU for doing something environmental, planting a tree or something like that. Now, in summary, this biodiversity strategy and the forest management hinges on financing rural development projects to maintain people on the land. And in, for, in Europe's biodiversity narrative, it essentially inverts the dominant degradation narrative of nature-society relations that we're familiar with in the tropics. And in fact, the EU's concerns are anti-Malthusian. So let me wrap up with a few concluding comments. Now, in contrast with forest policy and science in Africa, excuse me, the contrast with forest policy and science in Africa is striking. In Africa, in one country after another, people have been forcefully evicted from their ancestral lands in the name of biodiversity conservation, while in Europe, conservation efforts are directed at trying to keep rural people in place. In Africa, pastorals have faced decades of state pressure to destock, sedentarize, fence pastures, Etc. stop burning. Meanwhile, in Europe, traditional extensive agroforestry, agro-civil pastoral systems, and transhuman grazing regimes are all considered critical to biodiversity conservation. So what can we conclude from the EU biodiversity narrative regarding the three questions I opened the paper with? First, do human activities improve or diminish nature? The European Council and the scientists it hires as consultants uh, seem to think uh, definitely in terms of biodiversity, humans improve nature. What of the second question? What is the relative weight of natural and social forests, forces in shaping patterns of flora and fauna? According to the EU's biodiversity narrative, these forces have worked together for centuries. The semi-natural forests that dominate Europe are nature-culture hybrids. The third and final question, does the nature-society dialectic manifest itself in distinctly different ways in different continents? This can be answered by considering the narrative of, of, for Africa similar to what we have in Europe. 
For example, one need only imagine conservation internationals claiming that biodiversity peaks under rural African land management, or the World Bank developing financial instruments to subsidize traditional land uses uh, to keep African systems in place. You just contemplate that to think about the geographical inconsistencies in conservation si scientists' ideas about nature-society relations. Now, there's much discussion among European scientists of the co-evolution of forests and human culture over the millennia. One article has uh, traced it back 100,000 years of co-evolution of culture and nature. I've found no such discussion uh, for Africa among foresters and conservationists, though the continent is, of course, the source of all human evolution. So would not the same processes of co-evolution hold in Africa as well? And if not, why not? In Europe, forest scientists and policymakers observe existing biodiversity, assume anthropogenic origin, and plan conservation action to keep people and land uses in place. In Africa, observed biodiversity is seen to be, seen to, assumed to be a product of natural forces. Conservation there has historically been about stopping whatever local communities were doing in order to preserve biodiversity. So why are traditional extensive farming practices in the tropics inherently threatening to biodiversity? Well, in Europe, they're inherently constructive of biodiverse landscapes. Ideology certainly plays a role. I see reflected in the IUEU's biodiversity narrative, Europe's early modern mapping of the world into areas of civilization and savagery. Europe is a unique union of nature and culture. The rest is wilderness full of savages, or at best, primitive cultures living off the fruits of nature, but not actually transforming it. So what if we extended the EU's biodiversity narrative beyond Europe to the rest of the world? How might prevailing policies of programs for environmental conservation and rural development be transformed? What is at stake, of course, is the coordination of human rights with biodiversity conservation. For the global south, there may be liberatory potential in the EU biodiversity narrative. That is, extended to non-European settings, it could create the conditions that would lead to more support and respect for the role of indigenous management systems in producing the very biodiversity that northern scientists wish to preserve. Thank you. Questions? Robin? Uh, yes, uh, thanks, uh, Rod. M my name is Robin Sears. I'm from the School for Field Studies, and I'm an ecologist. So I was uh, thinking about this strange paradox and the, rather the double standard of um, appreciating uh, human involvement in uh, maintaining biodiversity in Europe. And I guess the only, as an ecologist, the only way I can imagine justifying um, that double standard is, is the potential for the role of invasive species in Europe. And I'm, I'm wondering if there's any talk of invasive species being a, uh, of course, it's a, it's a human, well, it's a natural factor that was introduced by humans. So is there any talk of that in the Nature 2000? Uh, uh, yes, de yes, definitely. Um, the inv invasive species is one of their, their major concerns. But then, again, with the question of defining what's a natural forest and what's a semi-natural forest, they have trouble defining what's an invasive species, um, uh, species that regenerate themselves um, aggressively, you know, might be considered invasive, but they're not always considered invasive. All I can say is they wrestle with the problem. They do see invasive species as a major um, uh, issue in biodiversity conservation. Um, but I will say that those dynamics, that is, uh, what, which concern the EU puts forward from one year to the next changes, uh, not because of ecological science, but for some other uh, political reason, I think. Uh, Tom Rudell from Rutgers. Um, first of all, I wanted to say it's a very stimulating uh, argument and presentation. I guess the one uh, question I had was, what happens if you change the uh, comparison to, say, the Americas? And the reason I'm saying that is that evictions, you probably know Dan Brockingham's meta-analysis of, of eviction studies. 
it shows that they're overwhelmingly concentrated in Africa. And I'm just wondering if you change the, the comparison to, say, um, the U.S. and the rest of the Americas, what would happen, do you think, to the analysis? Um, well, I, actually, the, the, some of my original, I, I mean, the, the longer, longer versions of this paper, I was citing, um, you know, the sort, sort of myth of, of, of the empty lands in, in the U.S., um, the idea that um, uh, you know, in 1492, there, there was there was no uh, there was very little pe for, few people living here, etc. But also a series of books that came out uh, beginning in the late 1990s or early 2000s, uh, revisiting the history of national parks, mostly written by environmental historians, that that have essentially document you know from Yosemite to Yellowstone to Rocky Mountain to uh, Grand Canyon of evictions of, of Native Americans who had lived in these lands and, and continued uh, conflict over uh, what the treaty says in terms of who has rights to hunt, who has right, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, I think the overwhelming studies have been in Africa, but I think th that the closer we look uh, in other parts of the world, the more we see the same ki kinds of patterns. Uh, it's just that they were perhaps further back in history that, uh, and they're only beginning to be recovered because the myth of wilderness is so powerful in U.S. political ideology, I think. Peter Cray in University of Chicago. Um, first of all, I, I thought that was a fascinating and wonderful um, presentation. I certainly don't want to try and uh, defend Conservation International. I'll leave them aside. <laughs> and I don't want to defend uh, the EU either, but as someone who, who was actually engaged in forest management and, uh, uh, in the U.K., I'll, I'll sort of explore a little bit the way the way I kind of see it. I mean, I had responsibility for managing some some woodland in in southern England, which housed uh, uh, an important species, the hazel dormouse. And uh, the way that we maintained that habitat for the hazel dormouse was through exactly what you suggest: traditional management regime. In this case, uh, coppicing for the production uh, of charcoal. Uh, it's pretty clear to me uh, that the hazel dormouse is a native uh, species, that that hazel dormouse must have found habitats in which it could have lived um, in the UK before the point at which uh, coppicing for charcoal became a normal feature of, uh, of British landscape uh, woodland uh, management. So the question is, I think, you know, what are we trying to do through these management practices? And I, I think this. The simple answer to that is we're, we're, we're gardening. We're, we're putting in uh, uh, practices that uh, restore or mimic ecological processes that in the past would have happened naturally, uh, but today for whatever reason don't. So one might speculate that in the forests of southern England, uh, in a, a pre-human state, that those forests would have had sufficient natural disturbance in them to create enough habitats for the maintenance of some level of hazel dormouse um, population. But with the current population of the UK and the current landscape and the current way it's managed, that, those kinds of, of habitats naturally don't appear for the hazel dormouse. So the aim of management uh, is to kind of mimic those processes that no longer exist. And I hope that this is a theme that we'll see throughout this conference, which is about how succession, which will happen whether people are involved in it or not, and they will influence the ways that succession happens, how people interact with ecological processes to produce the outcomes that they desire. And I think, I think the EU are trying to grapple with that issue, and I, I, I would give them credit for trying to grapple with it on a larger regional area than on a country-by-country -country basis, because I think that makes um, biological sense. But as they do that, that obviously enhances the complexities of dealing with the whole system, and you get these these kind of idiocies that, that emerge uh, out of it. But I think it's really about trying to manipulate and garden ecological processes to achieve some sort of desired outcome, whether it's the hazel dormouse or typical Mediterranean landscapes. Uh, well, thanks very much for your comments. And, and I, I agree pretty much with, well, I agree with everything you say. And I think is, if I was sort of uh, flippant about the EU, it was, it's more about being flippant about ourselves and how we try to figure out what's, what the boundary between nature and culture is. And, and when you change 
uh, politically, you change the agenda to now it's biodiversity that we're not worried about soil anymore, we're not worried about water pollution anymore, we're not worried about timber production, we're worried about biodiversity. So here's a place that's biodiverse, how did it get that way? Well, people have been here for a long time, so, so it's really contrasting what they're, the way they're wrestling it in, 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 with in Europe, that they don't, they being states, environmental scientists, that it's assumed to be uh, the, elsewhere the product of nature and culture has nothing to do with it and if culture is there it's come in late and it's only making things worse and we have to separate them out. So I actually, I, actually, uh, I find the EU's efforts fascinating if a little bit quixotic maybe. So. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, ju I just can't resist sharing one quick story with you. The ministry that I worked for used to be called the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food. <laughs> and overnight, uh, in Mr. Blair's second election, it was transformed into the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. And that gives you a sense of that exactly. switch yeah. from agricultural production to environmental management. Um, this will be our last question. And Roderick, I, I want to thank you uh, also for your presentation because it, it raises it raised rather profound questions about um, what you called at the start the conceptualization of nature society uh, interactions and relationships, which I've been thinking about a lot over the last few months. And the first point to make is that um, you refer to a forest science. You know what you mean by forest science, and I know, but no such thing exists. What is called forest science today is, um, is forestry science. That's what, um, it, it's the, the science uh, advocated and practiced by members of the forestry profession, et cetera, et cetera. Interestingly, um, as scientific forestry, it was imposed upon people in places like Tanzania in colonial times, and it still remains a post-colonial memory that they cannot get rid of. Now, I would very much like, as I'm sure you would, to have a forest science that would look scientifically at how people um, exploit forests, manage forests from, from a scientific point of view. Um, forest, uh, foresters and members of the forestry science, uh, members of forest, forestry science, are not able to look at themselves from the outside in. Policy has always been something that um, is a technique rather than something that is incorporated within their discourse. And so it's really been left to people um, in global change science, the new land change science, and also conservation science to uh, try to uh, fill this void. But um, as you so uh, well illustrated in your uh, mention of hotspots, very often um, it, it's come out with almost symbolic representations um, that are led by NGOs, led by uh, governments in response to postmodern society, uh, and it, it's, uh, it, it doesn't really have that rigor that we would like to have, um, that we so badly need. Um, we also have bureaucratic conceptualization. I mean, the EU, uh, uh, the, the kind that you mentioned, um, is a very good example of that. And, and it's caught somewhere in between uh, the, 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 the various uh, scientific disciplines and also NGOs. And you know, what comes out is a, is a, is a mixture of those. Um, the final point is that you mentioned semi-natural forest. Now, I would guess that perhaps semi-natural forest, as you mentioned, it, it comes out of the FAO's Forest Resources Assessment 2005. So yes. it came up um, in that kind of maelstrom. Again, another kind of um, bureaucratic conceptualization, but one very tied to, in, in my view, to the productivist discourse that is very much linked to forestry science. So everything is all interconnected and we need clarity of the kind that I think you so badly want yourself. Uh, thank, thank you for those comments. Um, I, 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 the, they do indeed cite the FAO uh, when they're talking about semi-natural forests. And the, your comments about forestry science versus forest science, uh, my reference to a great deal of anxiety uh, among foresters, uh, forestry agencies in these, in these countries, so that the EU felt necessary to essentially put out a, a publication that you know, listed the 12 myths of Natura 2000 and forests. Uh, 
essentially because it is such a shift from traditional forestry science and, uh, and something I also didn't get into in the paper, the idea of the ruined landscape myth of Europe in which at one time all of Europe was forested including all the Mediterranean islands and now they're all gone. So foresters are trained in that idea of uh, the natural forests have disappeared. We need to try to sort of figure out how to get them back and, uh, and produce for timber. So they're, not, they're, they're trying to figure out where they fit in this. And I don't think there is a science yet uh, for dealing with it. Just a lot of anxiety. This is going to be very, very, very brief. 30, 30 seconds. Uh, okay. You can start now. Mohesh, uh, two things. One, uh, this separation, the idea that nature ought to be enclosed in Africa, mm -hmm. completely separated, does it take shape, say, between the 40s and 60s, at precisely the time the EU is rolling out these plans which are sort of pro-farmer or pro-cultivator? And is there a racial element to this? Because one is always struggling in Southern Africa, how dominated biology conservation is by whites, even today. Mm -hmm. And just to reverse the argument, if you apply it to the Americas, if you apply it to Southern and Southeast Asia, it's interesting. Partly because the mature forest ecosystem, ecosystems are so productive, even a lot of the ecologists in these areas actually argue for much smaller areas under exclusive strict protection than some Western scientists. You know, one can think back to Paul Lehaus and others in the 70s were advocating. So is that some way ecologically driven, many of these areas, Eastern Africa, dry landscapes, even is, though there's is, a what it, I'm sorry, is, is what it partly you, driven by the fact that these are dry landscapes and they uh, therefore uh, yeah. want to enclose larger, because they are large animal obsessed. <laughs> right, right. So, um, but just to answer that first question first, no, not necessarily. Um, the, the park, uh, Rusha National Park was actually a montane forest uh, area and uh, wasn't a dry landscape. Uh, and the ideas were introduced much earlier, uh, at least for in Tanzania, they were introduced by German foresters uh, at the turn of the 20th century, uh, end of the 19th century. And uh, there, that's why I referred to Marsh, is because Marsh's idea, not that Marsh is the only one that had that idea, but, but his ideas of humans as disturber of nature's, uh, disturbers of nature's harmony was essentially what, the, what uh, forestry science d developed under that idea and then was transferred to the colonies. At least in, in the case this is of truly the last one and very brief. Okay, please. I'm an undergraduate here. Um, I had a question. The explicit policies that are sort of flipped that you were talking about, I think that's an extremely compelling point. But I also think that there are a lot of parallels in terms of local populations. Um, last year in Greece, in the summer, there were these widespread fires. And there was this huge emotional response from excuse me, the population, the people, you know, it's their homes, it's their land, all that same thing that goes on when you're talking about the alienation for national parks and all that. So there's this level of emotional response from people and the distrust of their government. There was a lot of speculation about arsonists and using the land to develop. And then there's the overseeing, whether it's international conservation agencies or the EU. So I feel like between those three levels, there's a lot of parallels actually between the issues in Europe and the issues in Africa. And I was wondering if you could just say a little about the mechanisms maybe that could sort of balance the two things in both continents. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. There are parallels. And I, I didn't mean to gloss over them, although I had to. Um, that, you know, the, I mean, my interest in Africa was very much informed by European social historians talking about uh, enclosure movement in the late 18th, early 19th century. Um, and so there are parallels. And the other, and in terms of what you're talking about, the, uh, the situation in Greece last year, it, uh, it, it also re refers that I think the EU's efforts to sort of claim that people are the land managers and we need to keep these rural communities going is a, is a political as much as, if not more, of a political exercise than an environmental conservation exercise because it's in the rural areas where the EU support is, is weakest. So I think that um, a lot of this policy is, uh, is about sort of building up political legitimacy for the, for the EU. How, you can't really demonstrate that very, very clearly, but I think your example is a good case in which rural populations do not exactly not only trust their own government, they certainly don't trust EU bureaucrats and, and 
uh, Brussels. Well, thank you very, very much. Thank you.